All right, um, we're going to get started very shortly. Try to be up and running for 4.15. Mountain Standard Time, wherever that is. This is Tucson, Arizona, the Controlled Environment Agriculture Center. And my name is Gene Giacomelli. And it's a pleasure to welcome you again to another one of our Covering Environment Seminar that Rafi Bruner puts together for us. And he brings in these these guest speakers that are just phenomenal. I'll ask, uh, welcome everyone here. I'll welcome everyone out there. And I know you're out there because I was just at the Atlanta Indoor Agriculture Conference in Atlanta. Ag Atlanta, get it? And people came up to me and said, yes, I recognize your voice from the seminars. And I said, good, I'm glad it's the voice and not the face, right? That's <laughs> big trouble. But it was uh, 270 people showed up on a Sunday. Now, Atlanta is a great place to go, but 270 to talk about how to grow vegetable crops inside of buildings, inside of greenhouses, and trying to um, educate people, getting experience in growing. It was, good, it was a good opportunity. I'm glad I had the opportunity to go. But we're here today for our February seminar, and I'd like to invite Rafi Gruner to um, introduce our speakers. Thank you, Gene. No, they can't hear you. He said, thank you, Gene. <laughs> okay, so um, I want to also welcome all of you. Uh, our crowd here is getting better and better, and uh, larger and larger, and more and more faithful to the seminars, and I'm very grateful for that because we put a lot of effort into it, especially the speakers. And uh, I want to also uh, thank uh, an unsung hero without whose participation uh, these seminars would lack an enormous amount of technological implementation, and that's Dave Bogner, who is always here to put us on the web and to record and to uh, make sure that the videos get posted on the SEAC website in good time. And, Please give him a hand as you started to do it. <laughs> I, also, I also want uh, to thank Aaron today, who is back uh, temporarily with us. He helped uh, do all of the uh, um, arrangements. So now to the introduction. Our first speaker today, and we're going to have two speakers. Our first uh, speaker is Kevin Fitzsimmons, who um, I started when I wrote uh, his uh, uh, bio sketch, so to speak, publicity piece uh, for his seminar, I started by saying that he was twice president. And then I paused. And I think he was a little confused because he wrote back to me and said, what are you talking about? And so I had to say, World and U.S. Aquaculture Societies, he was president of these two very important ag uh, aquaponic uh, uh, organizations twice. I then looked more and more about what kind of activities he's been engaged in over the years, and I could not find one single country that Kevin has not visited professionally. So he is really one of our really most extensive ambassadors from the University of Arizona to all of these places, sharing his knowledge, expertise, and uh, goodwill with uh, uh, aquaponic uh, startups, aquaponic people who want to be in the business and who want to connect plant world to the uh, fish world. So I think that's enough of an introduction and he's going to talk to us about this topic, technological advances, trends, and everything else. And I'd just like to quote one more thing that is scattered among the things that uh, are written about him on the web. And that is that he said at one point that aquaponics is, uh, has a long history from the pharaohs, and you'd expect him to say, into the present. No, into the future. So now I'm going to let All you right. prove it to us. There we go. Thank you, Rafi. And so, uh, I appreciate the chance of coming and, and speaking to everybody today. And uh, so I'm going to be covering uh, both aquaculture and aquaponics uh, today. And so uh, aquaculture, pushing the wrong one here. 
Okay, now go. Got All right, so uh, as as I'm sure most people know, aquaculture uh, is rapidly growing, and as the planet uh, has seven billion, eight billion, nine billion people, we're going to need to be getting our seafood from from farm raised situations, domesticated animals and plants, rather than hunting and gathering out of out of the oceans. Um, and so um, aquaculture has just made huge advances in productivity in the last 40 years. Basically, we are doing with aquaculture what we did with terrestrial agriculture over the last four or 5,000 years. We are doing now in the last 40 or 50 years. So domesticating animals, domesticating plants, uh, is is happening as we as we speak. Um, and with uh, aquaculture around the world, we're looking at at all kinds of things: fish, mollusks, uh, uh, shrimp, bivalves. We're looking at seaweeds, all kinds of, of things. So it's virtually as diverse as terrestrial agriculture. Um, and one of the nice things is that we can take advantage of so many of the advances in agriculture, agronomy, biology, uh, genetics, nutrition that have occurred for terrestrial agriculture that we can apply to aquaculture. Um, so this has been uh, a, a, a great help. And as we go further into the future, I think we're going to be able to see uh, how that's going to work uh, even better. And so as we, not only from agriculture, but some things from water quality, from telecommunications, uh, chemistry, medicine, all of these new technologies that we can apply to aquaculture and uh, aquaponics. Uh, all of the advances that we've made in nutrigenomics and uh, uh, nutrition, all of these things, the physiology that we've picked up on, whether it's cows or goats or anything, we can also apply to fish in, in many cases. Um, the microbiological advances in recent years, being able to do uh, microbial genomics of getting an entire population has turned out to be really important for aquaculture because we can look at the sediment in a pond, we can look at the water in the pond, we can look at the gut of the fish or shrimp and identify what's happening on a microbial community. And uh, as you can imagine, being able to do that underwater uh, really is, is a big help to our understanding of what's happening in the ecology of a pond or ecology of a raceway, uh, any of these things, the ecology of a, of a cage out in the ocean. Uh, the genetics, as everybody knows, uh, is really moved along very quickly. And as we are trying to domesticate fish and shrimp and clams and oysters, uh, all these kinds of things, uh, having these genetic tools available is really helping uh, not only the selective breeding, the traditional pedigreed type, crossing the biggest male to the biggest female type breeding, but uh, eventually to do GMOs. Right now, we really aren't doing any uh, genetically engineered, genetically modified uh, uh, animals for food with the exception of Atlantic salmon. Aqua Bounty up in Canada has a GMO salmon that's been approved for human consumption. That's the only one so far, uh, plant or, or animal. So uh, also it's all around the world. Aquaculture in the US is actually a pretty small uh, industry. 
Eastern Asia, South Asia are way, way ahead of us. They've been doing it for, for hundreds and hundreds of years. The first aquaculture textbook on raising carp by Fan Li was written 240 BC. Okay, I have a signed copy that he gave me. But I've been here a while. Um, no, but I, I, I do have a copy of it, UNFAO translated into six different languages. And so people are still using it. You read this and it reads like it was written 15 years ago. Pretty amazing how advanced the Chinese were on breeding carp that far back. Um, so again, we're following along what terrestrial agriculture has done in the last 100 years. And we're just now applying that uh, to, to salmonids in the last 20, 30 years, to tilapia and some of the other species I work on just in the last 10, 15 years. Really seeing some rapid improvements. Uh, we've also now done the genome on most of the key aquaculture species. So uh, carps are the most widely farmed fishes in the world, excuse me, the most Farmed. Uh, China alone does like 30 million tons of carps. Uh, but outside of that, uh, Southeast Asia, in India, Indonesia, uh, Nepal uh, grows some carps, uh, and then Eastern Europe and Israel. Pretty targeted areas. Tilapia is the second most commonly farmed fish. And UNFAO has statistics from 140 different countries that farm tilapia. So that's the most widely uh, group of, of fish. And with the genome project, now people are really beginning to understand what's in the genetic makeup of the fish and can uh, target things. Selected breeding programs uh, is coming along quite quickly now. Again, nutrition, the feed technology. Uh, has really uh, changed a lot in 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 recent years. Uh, we basically uh, started using extruders to make aquaculture diets. Basically, the same things that we make uh, uh, Cheetos and Cheez-Its and all these manufactured foods uh, turn out to be really good for making uh, uh, floating feeds for uh, uh, aquaculture. And this is really important because up till now we were making sinking feeds. You'd throw it out there in the pond, the fish would splash around, grab it, and some of the feed would sink to the bottom and they'd never get it. Going with an extruded feed uh, keeps it floating up on the top. The fish eat it. You can see exactly what they left or if they haven't. Uh, finish, you stop feeding, or if they ate it all in the first five minutes, well, go ahead and throw another couple hundred kilos out there. Okay, so this has made a big difference on feed efficiencies and improving water quality uh, in our in our systems. Uh, the amount of fish feed that's being made around the planet has just been skyrocketing, as you can see. Uh, really important as we grow more and more fish and shrimp and, and other other animals. One of the things that I'm involved in is a uh, uh, fish feed contest where we're trying to encourage the industry to get away from using fish meal and fish oil. This is really a constraint for the aquaculture industry of going out and collecting forage fish, grinding it down, making fish meal, fish oil to put back into the aquaculture diets not all that efficient and things like sardines and anchovies people could be eating. So we'd like to switch over to things like soy products or single cell proteins like yeast or bacteria, algae that could be grown uh, in bioreactors, uh, uh, phytoplankton type, type things, insect meals uh, that are produced on, on food waste. Uh, all of these other ingredients are, are out there now. And so uh, we were able to raise a couple hundred thousand dollars for this prize. That's some Silicon Valley type people helping us with the contest. 
and uh, uh, it's really all of a sudden really catching on. People are looking at all these alternative ingredients. Uh, again, trying to make the industry more sustainable uh, over time. As you can imagine, water quality for aquaculture and aquaponics is critically important. And our ability to monitor that water quality in real time uh, is really just happening, almost as we speak. Uh, when we first started, it was all little test kits, like checking your chlorine in the in your swimming pool, colorimetric type tests. And now we've got all kinds of probes and uh, things that you can keep it in real time, hook it to a computer and, and know exactly what your pH, your conductivity, your dissolved oxygen, all these things are. So this has been uh, really, really important. Uh, we also understand the biological systems better, how we can use bacterial colonies to help uh, improve our water quality. How we can have nitrifying bacteria, denitrifying bacteria, heterotrophic bacteria, rhizobial bacteria, all fitting into these systems to, to make them uh, more productive and, and more sustainable at the same time. Uh, and we've got some more good physiochemistry, uh, ozone generating systems that can add oxygen and oxidize materials in our uh, systems. Uh, what we call biofilters or floating bead filters, which are uh, media, plastic usually, that gets biofilms on it. And you pass the water through these biofilms, and, and they treat the water. Uh, so a lot of things. Uh, membrane filtration, a lot of things that came out of reverse osmosis and uh, filtering seawater to get fresh water, um, all these kinds of things now we can apply in uh, aquaculture. So a lot of technologies that have, have come on board in, in recent years. Um, the chemistry, inorganic and organic chemistry. Uh, so much has been happening in the last 10, 20 years that we can apply to aquaculture and aquaponics, whether that's uh, controlling uh, wastes in the system or adding ingredients to the diet, uh, organic salts, inorganic salts, uh, all kinds of things that, that we've learned about. Um, uh, vaccines. Uh, we used to use a lot of antibiotics in uh, salmon culture, catfish farming, things like this. Now we vaccinate most of the fish. So antibiotic use has, has gone, gone way down. Um, communications. Uh, I mean, obviously, things like, like cell phones uh, have been very helpful. Uh, waterproof phones have uh, been a big deal for aquaculture people, as you can imagine. Uh, but just the data acquisition that we can do uh, with, with uh, all the new equipment. Digital microscopes, uh, you know, trying to fit a 35 millimeter camera on there and take your pictures and all that kind of stuff, that's all gone away. Now you've got your digital capture, boom, boom, you just push a button and you've got a digital image of, of whatever it was you're looking, and the prices have come down immensely. Um, or as most of the students in class know, they just pull out their cell phone, take a picture, and they've got it there too. So. That's all been pretty good. Submersible cameras, uh, ROVs, underwater drones uh, have turned out to be really great to inspect cages on, on fish farms out in the ocean. Um, uh, scuba divers, all the better equipment that's out there, the ability to talk, put a little radio set in your, your uh, uh, scuba mask and being able to talk to somebody else underwater. All these things are, are really new technologies that have been uh, really great. Obviously, the wireless satellite stuff, uh, really good. There's a whole bunch of new smartphone applications uh, that are putting electrodes, different probes, that now you just plug into uh, your earphone jack. And you can just read off all your data 
right off your smartphone. You don't have to go out and buy an expensive meter. Uh, and then you just do the app in there and it can give out all the information you want. Really great stuff that's, that's out there now. Um, and just the growth of the internet, the ability to get uh, uh, papers off, things like ResearchGate, where you can get uh, PDFs of, of articles for free uh, anywhere in the world. Uh, it's great. YouTube, all the different YouTube videos that are out there on fish farming and aquaponics uh, really help to educate students, educate the public. Uh, really been been uh, really uh, helpful. Uh, the delivery companies, the Amazons, the FedExes, the UPSs. Uh, I remember starting out, and you wanted to get this stuff. Well, you order it, comes in a couple weeks, and then you know now, boom, you can get it almost uh, overnight, almost anywhere in the world. Uh, all of these things are really helping aquaculture, aquaponics uh, expand really quickly. So then we also have the production systems. Where are we growing uh, these fish and shrimp and, and crabs and everything? Uh, new cage design for out in the ocean. Uh, submersible cages that you can fill up with fish, sink them down, ships can go right over them. Uh, then you just float it back up with if you want to feed them or harvest them. Uh, a lot of new technologies. Uh, double nets, uh, nets that have got built-in cameras to, to monitor uh, 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 all kinds of things. Uh, some of them now have uh, a hard bottom, so all the waste from the fish goes down into a cone and you can pump it out, go use it for fertilizer somewhere so you're not releasing any nutrients uh, into the ocean water. Uh, lots of, of new technologies. Uh, recirculating aquaculture systems. Basically, great big giant aquaria for growing animals. Uh, recirculating the water, going through filter systems, back in minimizing the discharge, uh, or in aquaponic systems, using plants in there to filter the water, have the plants absorb all the nutrients, filter that water, clean it up, put the clean water back to the fish. Um, in these systems also, we now understand most of the nutrition, so you can have a very complete diet. Got all the micronutrients, the vitamins, uh, fatty acids, amigo, um, omega-3 acid, uh, fatty acids, everything you need uh, that we understand a lot more. The automation, the computer support that goes in there. Uh, we know how to get low-cost supplemental oxygen. We know how to get the CO2 out. So these systems are very sophisticated, what we call on-land farms. And so more and more we're seeing trout farms, salmon farms, shrimp farms all coming on land, just recirculating the water, uh, putting it near a city so you have low food miles to, to deliver to uh, urban markets. Uh, happening very quickly. And then we've got some really large scale operations. Uh, this was a farm that we developed over in Eritrea in East Africa. Uh, basically we dug a canal from the uh, uh, from the Red Sea uh, over, uh, brought it into uh, these series of, of ponds where we had the shrimp and tilapia, and then the water went to mangrove restoration and to grow uh, salicornia. Uh, seaweed farming. Doesn't look all that high tech in this photo, but uh, the hatchery technology is, is pretty high tech. We finally figured out how to induce seaweeds to redu uh, release spores and how to grow those spores, and uh, seaweeds have got some pretty complex life cycles. Uh, but here we just put some ropes, put the seed on the rope, put the rope out, floating raft, and then the farmer comes along. He can cut off all but about uh, 8 or 10 centimeters of, of the seaweed, and then it will all grow back in another couple of weeks. And he can just keep harvesting from the same 
field of seaweeds out there. In this country, how many people know that you've eaten seaweeds? Okay. So the nori wrapper on sushi, seaweed salad at a sushi bar. Um, it also goes into toothpaste. Also goes into um, all kinds of products. If you actually look at, at uh, breakfast bars, energy bars, they all talk about algenic acids and all these kind of things. Are all seaweed products. Um, who's ever poured a plate of uh, auger for microbiology? It's a seaweed product. All the auger in the world comes from red seaweeds. Virtually all of them farm raised. Uh, Indonesia, Philippines, each year they, they pass each other depending on who turned in their production statistics last. It provides hundreds of thousands of jobs in that part of the world growing seaweeds just for auger. Uh, either auger for microbiology or auger uh, they use for, for foods. In a lot of Southeast Asia, they use auger the same way that we use uh, uh, corn syrup. They use it as a sweetener. They use it to make candies and desserts. They make gummy bears and all that kind of stuff. And the auger is a galactose instead of a fructose, much more uh, healthy to be using. So we've done a lot with integrating shrimp and, and fish with seaweed culture uh, in different places around the world, much more sustainable uh, farming system. Uh, most recently, we're doing some of this in, in Saudi Arabia, uh, where a uh, national prawn company there, uh, one of the two or three biggest shrimp farms in the world is in Saudi Arabia. They've got 30 kilometers of coastline. And these, these little, little bitty tiny square ponds are each 20 hectares. So it's a huge area, a lot of shrimp production there. Uh, and we've done research more recently there, trying to integrate the seaweed uh, and fish culture into the whole whole system again to make it a bit more sustainable. Uh, processing technologies, uh, value adding product, more high quality fresh product. You get it from the farm, it's usually in a processing plant within a couple of hours as opposed to commercial fishing where they often take a long time. This is a particular project that I'm really keen on uh, using seaweeds to make paper. And when I first heard about this, I thought, okay, well, this is kind of an interesting little, little project. And he showed you know, how you could do it. And you can use lower temperatures. You don't need to use chlorine. Uh, there's not as much waste when you use uh, seaweeds. But then he started showing these pictures of pretty large scale equipment. And it turns out this is a commercial paper company doing this. And they're doing it on a really large scale already. And so they were taking more red seaweed than they could just go out and collect from the wild. So they've gotten into farming. Uh, and so uh, they've gone to uh, Indonesia now. And they're starting to farm there to supply their, their paper mill. And so far as I'm concerned, if we could grow seaweeds, stop cutting trees, grow all these seaweeds in front of Manila or Jakarta, uh, Ho Chi Minh, you know, all these Bangkok, these giant cities that are putting all this pollution into the water, all the nitrates and phosphates from millions and millions of people. The seaweeds could clean up, use up all those nutrients. They're going to fix a lot of carbon dioxide. They'll reduce the acidification of the ocean and provide hundreds and hundreds thousands of new jobs. And again, we can leave our trees growing. So I'm really keen on this technology spreading. Um, so again, aquaculture growing really fast. Uh, more than 50% of all of our seafood now is farm raised. 2012, for the first time, we raised more fish on the planet than we did beef. And that is going up more and more each year. Um, Nice thing about aquaculture, you don't have any bycatch. You're not taking big ships out there. Um, it's a lot safer. Uh, 
and you know fishing. It's hunting and gathering. We don't hunt and gather for commercial food anywhere anymore. It's a hobby. Okay? You go out and shoot your deer, or you go pick your berries or whatever, but nobody's trying to make an industry uh, out of it. So commercial fishing is really going down quickly all around the world. I mean, how many fishing ports can you think of that all been shifted over to marinas? And they've all got fancy restaurants and everything in there. Nobody wants a big, stinky fishing boat in there that's offloading in the middle of dinner. Okay? Um, all these TV shows, movies, Deadliest Catch. I mean, there's a reason they call it Deadliest Catch. It's a really dangerous occupation. Uh, people get hurt all the time out there. And so, uh, you know, a few more years, fishing's going to be like, shooting buffalo or trapping beavers or shooting passenger pigeons. You know, it's not going to be so cool. Um, uh, one, one issue we do have, one of the challenges of aquaculture, is we still have very large commercial fishing interests in different parts of the world that, that are not thrilled that they're losing their jobs to farmers. Okay? Any more than the buffalo hunters wanted uh, people coming out raising sheep and cows out on out on the range. Okay, so we also have uh, trade issues. I mean, the catfish farmers in Mississippi and Alabama don't want uh, Vietnamese catfish coming in. The Alaskan salmon uh, fishers they don't want uh, farm-raised salmon coming from Norway or Chile. Uh, so there's there's issues there, uh, but they they have a hard time competing. I mean, if, if a guy in Texas or Louisiana can't go out and catch a bunch of shrimp for free and bring them back to shore, and somebody else can go to Hawaii, Mexico, Thailand, wherever, build a hatchery, buy brood stock, stock their ponds, feed the shrimp for four months, pay somebody to go harvest them, process them, and then ship them halfway around the world. And if they can sell that in Louisiana or Texas, Texas cheaper than the guy to go out and catch them for free. There's something wrong with that guy's economic model. And to say that they're dumping is a joke. It doesn't even make sense. But you pay the politicians enough, they'll they'll take care of it. Okay? But they're not going to keep doing it forever. So they might do it for the next four years, but after that they'll they'll, they'll stop. Um, so we're just seeing these commercial fishy, fisheries going out. Sport fishing's taking its place. Okay, Texas, California, Florida, lots of sport fishing, uh, taking and, and going after most of the same species. Um, so we're going to have most of our seafood is going to be farm raised. Uh, the environmental sustainability of farming it is way better than going out taking boats trying to catch it and dragging. Crawl nets across coral reefs and things like that that, that happen now. Uh, the quality continues to improve on, on aquaculture products. Prices have stayed stable for years. Uh, wild fisheries, the price keeps going up. Farm raised stuff, pretty stable. So the aquaculture is more sustainable, environmentally more sustainable, economically getting better and better uh, all the time. So. Why don't we cut there, and we're going to take time for a couple of questions? After the second talk? OK, good. Um, yeah, I've got a conference call, but not till 530. Um, that may be a harder. Um, Kevin. Yes. Yeah. Hang on, so the people on the line can hear. You didn't mention any difficulties with the fish production, such as disease. What is the current state of disease and, and dealing with that? Sure. Um, yeah, there, there certainly are uh, disease issues with uh, farm-raised fish, farm-raised shrimp. Um, as a matter of fact, we have the world's premier shrimp pathology group here at University of 
uh, Arizona. Uh, so um, just as with any other terrestrial agriculture, we have plant diseases, shrimp diseases, fish diseases, um, and we're working with the technology. Again, we're taking lots of technology that come from human diagnostics, uh, genomics, all this work that been developed for human pathology and diagnostics, and we're applying it to aquaculture diseases. Uh, just as they are plant diseases in greenhouses and, and uh, vertical farms will have all the same issues, but again, the technology's uh, coming along so quickly it really helps us keep ahead of it. Initially, there was an association with shrimp farming and damage to estuaries. I just wondered what the current status of that is. Yeah, uh, good question. Uh, when shrimp farming first got started, a lot of it uh, occurred in uh, mangrove areas because that's where the shrimp you know, naturally were. So people assumed that was a good spot. So they were bulldozing mangrove swamps and building ponds. It, it turned out pretty quickly that that's a terrible place to try to farm shrimp. You're subject to far uh, to uh, floods, tsunamis. Uh, the soils in these are very acidic, uh, so it's not very good place to be be farming. They're full of birds who all like to eat shrimp, uh, so that became problematic. Now most farms uh, are actually in plastic-lined ponds. Uh, that they build quite a ways inland, uh, and uh, it turns out most of these shrimp can do fine in salinities that are just uh, two or three part per thousand, so one-tenth of seawater. So they just need to put a little bit of salt in there, you grow the, the shrimp up, uh, and it's not near the problem that they had. Almost every country in the world has outlawed cutting mangroves. Uh, for shrimp farming. So, yeah. Uh, Hang on. There you go. Kevin, why don't you tell this group, you talked about tilapia, but tell this group the role of the University of Arizona in shrimp farming today, how that important thing has to the whole world. Sure. Well, the University of Arizona was one of the uh, pioneer research groups on uh, uh, both shrimp farming and tilapia farming. Uh, the shrimp farming started uh, back in the 1970s down in uh, Sonora, uh, Rocky Point, Puerto Penasco, uh, with the first uh, attempts to reproduce the uh, Mexican blue shrimp was first domesticated at, at those farms uh, down there in Sonora, uh, which eventually grew into quite a large industry in Mexico, uh, but became a big industry all around the world. Uh, about two-thirds of all the shrimp in the world now is farm-raised. Uh, and all the disease work was developed here. I have a question for uh, Dr. Coelho. Uh, the, one of the limitations, at least apparent limitations of vertical farming, is the crop size, the height of the plants. Um, I've seen some images of plants growing upside down, which creates another problem, uh, that of leakage of nutrients. But could you talk a little bit about the issue of uh, limitation on crop size? Right. Uh, this may be biasing you because I showed you a picture of a shipping container, which is a modular unit, the most uh, probably uh, uh, common modular units that we see around, uh, but a module here does not is not limited in dimensions to that of a shipping container. It can be as big as this room or larger than this room. Now, having said that, it's it's correct. Uh, you can increase your productivity better if your plants are shorter as opposed to taller, uh, so that you can minimize as well the vegetative growth of the crops that you're growing. If you're growing crops uh, that are that have less vegetation or vegetative parts as opposed to the, the fruit or the crops that you're interested in, uh, that would be better. Uh, of course, for salad crops, that's, that's another point. Uh, 
But yeah, so uh, in other words, there should be some plant breeding associated in terms of perfecting and optimizing the performance of a vertical farm. And perhaps even genetic engineering, it cannot be ruled out. Other questions for Kevin or me? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> Excellent presentations. Thank you very much. For um, Joel Coelho. Okay, Jim. If you would. Um, you speak about vertical farm in containerized controlled environments using hydroponics, I presume, presume in some manner for producing food in the cities or in the urban areas. Um, can you speak that relative to other options of growing food in urban areas right. uh, about the concept of urban agriculture correct, correct. where yes. this vertical farm right. or indoor growing could be one, yes. one way to do it. Have you investigated that and does it suggest that this is the, the more optimal way to do it. Okay, uh, and, and that is a very uh, good uh, question uh, and point for clarification, Gene, because urban agriculture is not just vertical farming. Uh, there's quite a number of versions or uh, manifestations of uh, urban agriculture, one of which is a community garden. It could be rooftop greenhouses or it could be a vertical farm. Uh, so it, it depends on the particular city, its architecture, uh, how the buildings are, their, their dimensions, whether there's available rooftop, and so on and so forth. Uh, so all of those, I have to say, uh, should be pursued. Um, and whichever makes economic sense, uh, definitely uh, it should be pursued, whether it's community garden or vertical farming or rooftop greenhouses. Uh, the advantage of vertical farming is that it can really be designed uh, in such a way uh, that it could be a uh, standalone. So it, that you don't have to be dependent on the architecture of a particular building. And again, as I try to emphasize, this does not have to be located right inside the city uh, because the challenge there is that real estate in cities typically is of very high value. So it wouldn't make sense to do it right in the middle of Manhattan, perhaps, uh, building a new building specifically for vertical farms. So just outside the city, around the city, or a certain number of miles from the city would be fine, just like airports. More questions for Kevin. How about online? Do we have questions online? Yeah, all right. Okay, so we really appreciate this. So thank you thank so you much. Thank much. you.